freaking what up, dude? Um, Strider Wilson, and I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. It's gonna be called History is Nice. Friggin' what up, dude? Your host, Strider Wilson, just posting up in the studio right now with Aaron on the sticks. Dude, what up, Aaron? What up? Just chilling, dude. Dude, I've been having a b- debate with my freaking bros, Jace and Chris, dude. JT's younger bro, dude. And we were talking, dude. We were like, you know, when it comes to, like, dudes, you know, because of my crazy neighbor, Ignacio, right? We were kind of talking and... Um, Ex-neighbor. Like, Thank you very much, my former neighbor. Uh, I'm like, part of the reason we moved was, one, you know, he was definitely out of his mind probably on drugs but also if it came to fisticuffs he was jacked and he would definitely pin me and beat me i'm comfortable admitting that okay um even my df my dang fiance will tell me no strider you could do i'm like thank you so much that's a sign that you love me but not this guy would dominate me um but then we were like jace is a crazy neighbor who's like a dj and has like strange like you know sort of like druggy friends come over dude if your personality is the, the the main adjective of it is druggy dude you know, what are you doing, dude? You know, like, that that's cool for a hot second maybe in middle school, but let's go, dude. Mix it up, dude, and get better at soccer. If you're a soccer druggie, at least it's a step in the right direction, you know what I mean, dude? But, like, um, he's like, dude, dudes are coming over, and he's like, I saw this guy who accidentally knocked on my door, and he was the most gaunt man. I'm thinking gaunt versus a buff, dude. If a dude knocks on your, is a little bit upset, you know, in the middle of the night, knocks come a rap tap tapping on your door dude mm-hmm. i'm going i don't want to see a gaunt man out there you know over a buff guy yeah because he's going to have endurance right yeah and, and, and he's probably been awake for four days correct on on who knows probably meth and he's probably mm-hmm. crushing del taco mm-hmm. and, and and meth and who knows what he's looking for. The thing is... He's horny. He's horny. He's definitely... <laughs> there's no question he's horny, dude. You know, he's going to try to visit a DJ. And DJs get people horny. That's their job. Through rhythm. And it's like, dude... Chris made a great point. JT Younger Bro. He goes, with the buff guy, I know what he wants. He wants... He probably wants to bone my GF or DF or whatever if he's a real psychopath. Or he wants to watch the game. He wants a beer. He wants some protein powder or just to, like, beat my ass in, in assess physical dominance. So, you know, you can know how to navigate your way around those things. With the gaunt guy, you know, what what demon, you know, what demon god does he worship? You know, does he, does he looking for a virgin? Does he think I'm a virgin? I was a virgin for a long time. Maybe that's still good enough for his demon god. You know, maybe it's, it's COVID times and, you know, my blood, it will do. You know, what sort of sacrifice is he going to? Uh, I don't know. The gaunt man... I don't know how to how to operate with him. A buff guy, I get it. Take my Metrex powder and bounce. Later, dude. Sorry. Wrong door, you know? <laughs> Gaunt guy, what do I got to do? Am I going to have to, you know... If you could squeeze a muscle milk through the mail slot. Yeah, that'd be great. A muscle milk <laughs> packet, just get it flat. Or just, just, just put his... Ma- open your mouth down there and just straight up, you know, or Zamboni it off the floor if you have to, dude. I don't know, man. Gaunt dudes. Underestimated. Yeah. There's there's a threat there. Also, dudes who can do backflips, not enough respect. Totally. You can do a backflip. That's unbelievable. You should be hired on the spot, any job. I don't care what it says. I don't care if you can't read. You're definitely lying about being able to use Microsoft Excel. Everyone is. So do a backflip and you're hired. Yep. It's my only requirement, dude. You know, you know they're going to go to bat for you. They, they literally put their feet above their head. Yeah, there's something, that's something in my life where I've told myself, I will never do that. I will never be on the ground and do a backflip. It's something that will never happen for me. I can comfortably, confidently say that, Mm -hmm. you know, other stuff, maybe go to the moon, maybe better chance, better chance, dude, you know, moon hotel. Yeah. Backflip, no chance. Backflip on the moon, maybe better gravitational (laughs) situation over there. All right, dude. Aaron, today we're going to talk about Napoleon, bro. You've, we, we've both heard of Napoleon. Of course. But I got to tell you right now, I don't know jack shit about Napoleon, dude. What, what do you know about Napoleon? You know, if you're in a dinner conversation, dude. I mean, you know he was a general and an empire, emperor. Right. 
in France. Maybe you know that. Maybe you don't. Yep. That's about all I know. Uh, he was small. Which actually he wasn't. We were kind of talking about this before. He just hand. had an older brother who was a favorite son. You got the hand in the shirt thing. Yep. And then there's an island. There's some island. Yep. He goes to an island, St. Helena. Yep. And then, then, then maybe there's a... He tried to pick a fight with Russia. Yep. That didn't that's, work out. And then, you know, Hitler yep. repeated that mistake. The Russian campaign it was yeah. the sort of final straw on his downfall. Yeah. And so, then he's in Bill and Ted. Yeah. He's in Bill and Ted. Exactly. And you probably know the ABBA song, Waterloo. Mm-hmm. Maybe you know that. We've heard of the Battle of Trafalgar. We've heard of that maybe, but really what's going on? So, dude, freaking Jacob Lipinski, my freaking fire researcher, dude, legend, bro. He is the one who compiled this research, which, you know, is really artfully done. He references authors, dude. I mean, it just makes me feel like, honestly, dude, I'm, I'm begging for a dinner reservation, dude. I'm begging. I'm going around to coffee shops, dude, and I want to talk about Napoleon's Italian campaign. I just want to say that, dude. Let me tell you what. If you don't listen to any more of this episode, and dude, if you look, if you're up for a review at your job, and you know what I mean, and, and people are like, dude, Doug, maybe your name's Doug, and you play pe- Tetris in your computer at work, I mean, come on, dude, more power to you. As long as the emails get sent, you fire, play some Tetris. But what you do, Doug, is you also just memorize the phrase Napoleon's Italian campaign and go, it's really where he developed his style. And I feel like at this job, maybe it's, I don't know, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, I feel like my style at the Ontario airport really is, uh, it's about, look, I want to I want to be out in front of budget. I want to be out in front of Hertz. I want to be all attack and I want to get our cars and I want to get people in them. I want to butts in seats and, you know, uh, business on the road. And, you know, your manager's going to hear that. And you're going to reference, you know, what are you talking about, Napoleon? You just, then you just say the Italian campaign. And he will have no idea what that means, but he will then judge himself and curl up, and then you're going to get a promotion and definitely probably not fired for playing too much Tetris. So it's the the backflip of historical references. Aaron, dude, hundred percent, dude, fire freaking call right there. That's what I'm talking about, dude. Bring in the heat like that, dude. Bring in the freaking heat, dude. So what Jacob posits here, dude? He posits some fire questions and. And he says, you know, he, he sets the table up here. He goes, look, when talking about people's lives and individuals from the past, there's no real way to determine the headspace one is in when they carry out these decisions, dude, right? That effectively alter history as we know it, dude. You know, Napoleon was an emperor, dude. Conquered Europe. He altered a lot of people's lives, dude. Ended a lot of people's lives. So tragedy in that regard, dude. Um, so historians rely on evidence and they form rational interpretations, dude, of individuals and piece together an overarching thesis that explains the world of the past, dude. Freaking so dank right there. And so he talks about Napoleon um, through two different authors, dude, right? This, this dude, two historians, Jonathan Riley and Owen Conley, dude. And he says their books are freaking dank, dude. I'll mention them in a little bit. And they um, basically tackle the task of explaining the life and military career of Napoleon. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. Napoleon more as a commander and a general, and we'll sort of... Uh, perhaps judge him um, on, on that, dude. But really, I'm going to run down some some dates in a little bit, and I'm going to you know, I'm gonna try to keep it story. You don't want to get bogged down in dates with history. You're going to be straight up snooze fest on your commute to work, or you know, maybe you're listening to this at work, which will be fire. You know, Hopefully, Doug at Enterprise is doing that. Or excuse me, did I say, um, did I say Enterprise, or did I say Avis? Well, I think you said Enterprise and Hertz. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Enterprise, yeah. He's, he's probably posting up an Enterprise picking someone up right now. Dude. We don't want him to sleep and be late to pick someone up because that's what they do. So basically, dude, looking at these two authors, freaking Riley and Conley, sort of taking their thesis on Napoleon, they posit questions such as, was this dude as great as we think of him, dude? Was he really a great strategist, counterinsurgent, ultimate motivator, commander? Was his army even that dank, dude? Or do you have an unexplainable X factor like MJ, dude, or Kobe, or freaking, you know, the great freaking ballers, dude, that just, you know, enable them to refuse to lose? You know what I mean? Is it something in Napoleon's DNA, dude? And. Conley, in his book, Blundering to Glory, highlights Napoleon as the greatest commander of all time due to his innate ability to scramble, dude, or blunder. That's the term. He says blunder to glory. And so basically that just means just attack, attack, keep going, dude. Never freaking turn back, dude. Just out freaking well, just blunder is kind of a mistake. Right? Blunder, yeah. Well, blunder is a mistake. And I mean, well, it has to be, right, Aaron? Because mm-hmm. guess what? He went to Russia, yeah. came down, right? But he blundered to glory, dude. So he still is remembered. We're talking about his name today. Yep. So, and that's part of what it highlights. It's the double-edged sword. Uh, sword of, and he kind of talks about Napoleon's 
childhood and his rough upbringing with his father and being bullied for being like born in Corsia, which is like a sort of province of France. So it wasn't real nobility. So he like was sort of, you know, shunned and was the butt of jokes and he had he had an accent and so he'd be made fun of because of that so he always was made less than and so he developed his own narrative of i'm going to prove people that i'm better than so it all and you know an attack and just have like you know probably he probably had memorized like eight zingers before he even showed up to like class that day so he could take everyone out like that type of dude and uh so that's also what made him you know achieve all the glory that he did but then also he didn't adapt, didn't change, you know, in the end he kept doing his fight. Other generals were able to uh, emulate and counter and he ended up, you know, facing his downfall, which we'll get into. Um, then Jonathan Riley just looks at Napoleon as a general. So pretty much more of a militaristic book here. Um, if you're looking for that angle, I'd, I'd say probably go for Riley's book, dude. Um, I talk about it like I haven't, but that's what Jacob said. And he, the dude's got fire freaking outlook, dude. Um, so basically he talks about him as an effective logistician so you know the logistical uh, elements of being a general and getting people where they need to be but really his style wasn't like as a strategist of like oh i'm gonna win the battle before we even go out there he's more of like i'm gonna go out there i know you know i've studied militaries i and I, I'm, I'm a commander i know freaking where to place troops but i'm gonna sort of react yeah in the moment improvise call audibles exactly and so he's firing he would even move troops himself which part part of you know plays into his is you know, um, legacy of invincibility and being such a badass because he would be like, we need to get these troops over there now. And the other general would think like, no, that's never going to happen. That's a dumb maneuver. Why would you do that? And he's in, but Napoleon's thinking, and that was one of his great skills was making decisions with limited intelligence, like not his intelligence, but like military intelligence or like information based on what the enemy's doing. But yeah, you can only do what you can see. I mean, right. You don't know what's going on on the other side of the hill or exactly and that was sort of his x factor but it always relied on like it was basically you know that's the question chicken or egg is like his personality um of just attacking so like was he going to attack anyway basically was the information good enough to talk him out of attacking and like jacob said we will never know what was going through his mind in those moments and i think that's so fascinating about this guy someone who had such a huge uh impact on europe and then um you know generations to come of like what was going through it. we would love to be inside of that dude's dome. You know what I mean? Figuring out what's going on. I mean, there's a complex named after him, which is real. Although, uh, like we said, we don't think it really, um, he wasn't actually short. He was average. I think kind of people know that. Sorry for moving the mic. Um, he, he was average height. Um, it comes down to his brother, Joseph, who was the favorite son of his parents and he felt lesser than, and, um, that sort of played into that misconception. So like all myth, there is uh, it's rooted in some sort of realism. So, because I really don't know jack shit about Napoleon, Aaron, um, and thank you, Jacob, for this fire research, I'm going to sort of go down dates and just take you through sort of his campaign of Europe from, like, beginning to end. This is going to give you the big rundown, dude. Here's the freaking crash course of what's up, and then you, we can decide afterwards, do we think he was a good general? I think I, I tend to lean towards, you know, I'll put the freaking cart before the horse here and just tell you. Like, yeah, he was a fire commander. He wasn't a strategy guy, though. He did win some battles based on strategies. Um, but he would just do stuff. He would get troops. He was a fire motivator, dude. He, um, in a little bit, I'll tell you, like, what he did. Like, his PR machine was unreal. Like, the guy was just basically, you know, built... He built himself for the ba the battlefield. He manufactured himself as the best commander, whether he was subconsciously or consciously, probably a mixture of both. The dude was born... August 15th, 1769. What up? 69, dude. Up top. There we go, dude. Thank you. It's the only date I need you to remember. Other than that, I'll say some, but just have fun with the story. You know what I mean, dude? Um, so Napoleon's dad, dude, kind of like we mentioned earlier, um, he was huge on making sure the family, of course, got wealthy, like a classic Orange County father, like where I'm from, but also wanted them to be uh, noted as mo nobility, dude, because... That qualified him for grants from the king of France to go study at uh, high cl the high universities that were only available to nobles, you know? I mean, a lot of the population wasn't literate. I mean, it sounds like uh, maybe a little unfair and grounds for a La Révolution, which happens in 1789. Napoleon was a young man then, I think maybe like 19 or whatever. You do the math, dude. 69, come on, 20, 89. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, so he's there in like August 10th, 1792. He's there when they um, 
storm the freaking Palace de Tuyers. He sees them like massacre the royal guard. And this is uh, has an impact on him where he goes, dude, and you know, he, he knows he wants to be in charge. This guy, it's innate, it's in his blood, dude. He's been disrespected. He's got a huge, massive chip on his, he's got the world on his shoulder, dude. He's got Europe on his shoulder, a chip the size of Europe, dude. And he's thinking, I can't have this when I'm, he's t- saying to himself, when I can't, when I become emperor, when I'm the ruler, dude, I do not want uprisings like this. So it was actually um, something that he always had in the back of his mind and perhaps in, affected uh, battlefield decisions and maybe um, movements of his grand armée in the future because he wanted to keep um, peace in Paris, you know, and maybe part of why he kept wanting to conquer and bringing in, you know, look, when he's conquering and, and as an emperor, you better be bringing in the riches and keeping the people happy and even the have-nots. I mean, that's the whole revolution, have versus have-nots. So you got to make sure your nobility is happy with you because then they can try to take you out, which has happened on a number of occasions. And then you got to make sure the have-nots are, are staying motivated and getting a piece of the pie. Otherwise, you're in real trouble. So that was something that was always in the back of his mind. So then he's freaking going to the universities. He's studying, dude. He's becoming a freaking commander. He's probably going to parties on lawns. Basically, when I picture Napoleon, Aaron, who do you picture as Napoleon? I picture Leon the Assassin. What's that actor's name, dude? That French dude? Jean Reno. Yeah, I picture Jean Reno. Maybe I picture also the dude from The Patriot, even though he plays, obviously he's not Napoleon, but I love that dude um, in the movie uh, The Which Patriot. The villain? Not the villain, dude. He, oh, no, the, Patriot, oh, the, the French guy. Yeah, the yeah, French yeah. dude. I love that guy. Uh, he's also in another movie where he's like, there is a time for diplomacy. Diplomacy is dead. Yeah, that guy's great. I love uh, that actor. I don't know his name. But I picture, um, yeah, Jean Rene, dude. Who do you know, picture? Jean Rene's always Jean seemed Rene, older to me. Um, I know, but in my mind, that's just, and I picture him like in goggles from The Saint for some reason, or those cool glasses from, I picture like him from the cover of Leon the Assassin, <laughs> but dressed in colonial era uh, stuff. No, I picture a guy with like a really short haircut, not buzz, but like a Caesar kind of. Yep. Little curls around the Yeah, top kind there. of a little bit of a round face. Yep. You know who Michael Stolbarg is? No. Who's that? He was in uh, Boardwalk Empire. He was the he was a uh, um The Irish dude? No, no, no. That's that's another guy. Um He was A.R. Rothstein, the the um the guy who fixed the nineteen nineteen World Series. Okay. The Black Sox scandal. Okay, okay. Um, okay. He's been in a ton of stuff recently. Like, he's in The Shape of Water. Uh, okay. He's like the Russian spy in that. Who, I can't picture The him. doctor who has like a, but he has like a turn of heart for the, for for the, the sea um, monster. For sure. Um, he's in a ton actor. of stuff. Great, great character actor, yeah. Yeah. Blends into everything. Love that uh, dude. Gary uh, he, that's who I picture. Like, he's got kind of a, a straight nose and... Yeah. That's fire. Yeah. I'm going to freaking look that up later for sure, dude. Um, so, dude, earlier, like I mentioned, um, so, yeah, Napoleon studying, dude. Then we're now at 1796, dude. So we've jumped in time, 1789, you know, 1792. Now we're 1796, dude. Things are changing, dude. There's a revolution, dude. Stuff's going down, bro. And Napoleon, dude, he goes on an Italian campaign, bro. All right, dude? He becomes, you know, the freaking commander-in-chief of the Armée d'Italie. And uh, he gets dispatched, dude, because, you know, France wants no monarchies right now, dude, right? And, you know, France is now a republic, even though, you know, there's still our, ro- our royals and stuff. And um, things are still kind of changing. They're adjusting to the post-revolution. And um, after chopping off a lot of domes, dude. And freaking Napoleon, as a young general here, he begins to practice his strategy. He's notable in his young years for targeting the enemy's weak point, moving quickly and attacking with surprises to gain a psychological advantage, dude. The dude, and I say psychological advantage. So his Italian campaign's successful. He's fired, dude. Does a good job, bro. And he makes sure that it's noted that it's fired because he creates his own newspapers, dude. He founded two newspapers, Le Courrier de l'Emeré d'Italie and La France Vue de l'Armée d'Italie. And that's probably horrendous French, but that's kind of how it sounds. And here's uh, here's Michael Stolberg, by the way, coming up on the screen. Oh, I love that actor, dude. Yeah, he's yeah, great, yeah, dude. Yeah. Yes, dude. Yeah, that's my Napoleon. You guys have seen him. Dude, that's a great Napoleon. If I was doing a Napoleon movie, I would cast him for sure, dude. 
Oh, yeah. Great. Dude, that's who I'm going to now picture throughout the rest of this episode, dude. Great. It's nice to put it in my mind's eye. I like having that visual. You know what I mean? Um, and freaking Bonaparte would like tell the authors of this or the editors of this paper to, you know, just basically hype him up, dude. And, he, and one of the things was Bonaparte flies like lightning and strikes like thunder. He is everywhere and sees everything. He is seen. He is sent by the great nation. So basically that's a loose translation from the French paper. And he just has his own PR machine, dude. Savvy, bro. Psychological warfare. He's planting seeds of domination early on. Dude. The, pro the dude probably read Caesar. Okay, the guy knows what's going on. He's not reinventing himself, but it reminds me of a time when this dude in high school, who was honestly a schmoll, um, uh, his name was uh, Aaron, and he reinvented himself oh. uh, as Jake. So Napoleon is sort of not reinventing himself, but he's basically... Honestly, doing social media, he's, he's like basically has his own Instagram, which is the newspaper, a fire Twitter for himself. And, you know, that's what Jake did. He moved to Miami and he, uh, you know, he would take pictures next to sport cars and hold high caliber rifles with um, reptiles. And, yeah, I think he got some tattoos. And honestly, you know, I think he got laid out of it. So and maybe that's what he was seeking. So, you know, good for Jake. Don't know where he is now. Um, last I heard, he's dead. Kidding. It's what I do now. When I don't know the ending of stories, I say dudes are dead. Raises the stakes, makes people think. Okay? Doug from Enterprise, put that in your back pocket too. Uh, so yeah, dude. Napoleon is the PR machine, He's, but you know, you, you still got to win. That's the thing. However, do ya? Because then he goes to Egypt, right? And France wants to combat England's growing influence down there in Egypt, so they send him on a secret mission down there to sort of... Um, you know, make sure France still has a foothold down there. Um, Napoleon wins some battles on land, but, um, you know, the British Navy is the most superior and they're the best in the world, and they end up taking out the French fleet in Abcourt Bay, and um, Admiral Nelson's down there, dude. He's freaking dominating. I should probably do a nap on Admiral Nelson. And um, so basically the French lose, dude, and, you know, the British control Egypt for the foreseeable future. And... But then what Napoleon does is he makes a fire book out of his loss. He goes and he tells his editors, all right, now we're going to make a book because Egypt is exotic. It's sexy. It's interesting. And Napoleon still won some land battles down there. And he can say, oh, well, the Navy, that's not my thing. Like the Navy should have done their whatever. And everyone knows Nelson does this. But, you know, he, he, you know, he, can, he has the PR machine where he can say things aren't his fault. And he creates a cool uh, Egyptian exhibition um, or expedition book out of this loss so basically it becomes a win and at the backs are on the, basically on the backs of uh, a ton of soldiers dying so you know but napoleon's not really caring about that he's caring about rising up and freaking looking badass so now we're going to jump ahead to 1799 dude 1804 dude the coup d'etat of 18 brumaire year eight so year eight after the revolution dude um the consulate um, from 1799 to 804, oversaw the modernization of France, dude. The Bank de France was created, dude. They have their own currency, dude. They're basically reinventing a lot of stuff. There's the departments and prefets. The Code of Civil was written. The Légion d'Honneur, which we'll get into in a little bit, was instituted. Um, they're, they're building canals, roads, tunnels, dude. Basically all modernization of under like a term, masses de granit. Um, so it's basically progress in France. And as part of this, you know, who's going to be the leader? And, and, and these things are still being argued over. And um, Napoleon gives this sort of confused speech. Um, kind of people heckle him over it, dude. He, you know, he probably does not take well to being heckled. Um, things get a little violent. Order is restored because of one of his generals, Marat. And uh, honestly, dude, Napoleon is, for being a great commander, he has to have great generals and he would go nowhere without his officers he knew how amazing they were and he trusted them and um, he obviously inspired them and they were loyal to him but he doesn't give he was never one he would always be like i'm great i won this battle so i would say um maybe he should change his name to nishmolian for doing that because you got to have your boys backs and you got to give credit when it's due to your freaking bros so very unchill of him not to do that and especially since morath um, comes to his aid here in this moment when Napoleon probably made a weird rambling speech of like, I'd be good because um, I always look, I'm, I'm Corsian. And um, so I came from a have not, but I'm also noble. So I'm a good go between bridge here, but I really, I just want to be in charge guys. That'd be chill if I could do that. Like, 
You know, I imagine that's how that speech went, but he probably was trying to say it confident. Like probably it went how like when I leave a voicemail to um, when I, me and my GF were, GF at the time, now my freaking DF, dang fiance, were looking to rent new apartments and I'd start off, I'd be like, hello, my name is Strider Wilson. I would like to wonder um, if the, uh, if the unit, can I set up a time for availability? Is there a washer? Uh, just call me back, bye. And I'm like, dude, why can't I just get the script down, dude? Washer dryer in unit. Can I set up a time to meet and see the unit? Thank you. Call me back. Strider Wilson at freaking what up? So why can't I just do it like that? You know, maybe Napoleon had something like that. In any case, what ends up happening is Napoleon does get installed as the first consul, right? So it gives rise to both Republican and, and monarchist opposition. So this bridge that he thought he was doing just made no one happy, but... Maybe that's the world, what he wants, you know, when a dictators want disorder, dude, so they can just rule. And he got it because that night of August 24th, or what am I saying, dude, December 24th, 1800, while on his way to a Paris opera, Napoleon survives a bomb attack, dude, along the Rue saint Messias. It's along some freaking river road, probably, dude. And, you know, this is sort of the catalyst that he needs to be like, look, dude, things are out of control. He puts these in the papers. I need to appoint... You know, and then he just takes it. He looks, I'm Supreme Consul. This is wrong. People threaten my life. Uh, these are the laws that we're going to do. I'm going to appoint these ministers, these ambassadors, these army officers, and these judges under the new constitution. So, you know, I mean, probably conspiracy theorists would say that he probably did that bomb attack on himself to do that, but I don't think that was the case. So then in 1800, there's actually relative peace in Europe, you know? Um, you know, other European nations are wary of the politics of Republican France, under the very ambitious first consul Bonaparte. Um, so they're like, what's going on, dude? And he sends General Moreau to fight Austria, dude. And basically he wants to repeat his exploits of the Italian campaign. And Napoleon narrowly defeats the Austrians at Marengo, not the casino that's on the way to, uh, not Morongo on the way to the desert, which I love laying down. Freaking, I love playing two deck blackjack out there. 25 bucks a pop. Let's go. Give myself a nice little purse for the freaking G course on the weekend. But uh, the Austrians at Marengo, a victory that led to the signature of a peace of Linvie. And um, after freaking numerous diplomatic exchanges, dude, England even signs the peace treaty, dude. So Europe enters a period of relative peace after this battle in Austria. Napoleon's like, no, no, guys, I got to get me some real quick. But then after that, we'll, we'll, we'll be in peace. And um, But basically, this victory was pretty uh, savage by Napoleon, dude, because in order to win it, he had to freaking catch the enemy unaware, the uh, Austrians. And his entire army had to cross, including cannons and freaking munitions and horses, cross the Alps during May. And there was a heavy late snowfall. And... Um, the Austrians are like, nah, dude, there's no way he's going to get past this, bro. We're chilling, dude. But Napoleon does it, dude, because he's savage and he pushes forward always. And that's part of his personality. Attack, attack, never let up, don't relent. He ends up winning, dude. Where others rest, dude, and where others would struggle, he thrived. So basically how I sort of am in the gym. Very Napoleonic in the gym, dude. Um, especially when it comes to my freaking interior delts, dude. Don't sleep on those and my traps and my calves. Even though I have chicken legs, I'm working on it. Okay. Um, so then I remember I mentioned the Legion d'Honneur. This is pretty creepy, to, in my opinion. Like, there was a, like a religious um, concord that had to be signed, and uh, the clergy sort of had to become secular, and Napoleon does, sort of disrespects the Pope, and there's obviously a lot of Catholics in France at the time. And so um, he's like, you know, in... in if he's not quelling those religious uprisings, like I mentioned earlier, that's going to create unrest in his capital, and he doesn't want that. So what he does is he sort of battles it, and he goes, look, I'm going to create... He doesn't create... This has already kind of been instilled, but he's like, I'm going to really lean into this Legion de Honneur, and it's basically just nationalism in France, and it's like, if you're a good dude, and this kind of ties into like the, sort of the communist things where like comrades would rat out other comrades, and it's like, basically... He would give you like military awards, civilian awards, industrialist awards, scientists, artists... And basically could all receive honors for doing a good job for the nation in their area. And so then you could like get like medals and stuff. And it was, um, you know, very uh, a high honor from the nation. So basically people would pledge loyalty to the Republic and its government via this way. And uh, it was a way of creating, making himself more powerful while quelling sort of uprisings. And basically it was just a, a big distraction and, and a genius one, dude. So pretty fire, dude. 
Um, so then that works for a while, dude. And then in 1804, dude, Napoleon, he's chilling. And then uh, there's this, there's another uh, attempt on his life. And he, uh, he ends up executing after like a military trial. So it's very unjust, dude. Um, p- probably like a, the Bloody Revolution style. Um, although it's not with a guillotine, it's a firing squad. He kills Louis d'Anton, the um, Bourbon, the guy who's the head of the Bourbon monarchy, who, who he believes uh, tried to assassinate him. And then basically after this, um, you know, monarchists are upset. You know, Europe is kind of shocked that Napoleon would do something like this. Um, and then on the 2nd of December, 1804, Napoleon really leans in, all attacked it. He goes, they're like, as a first consul, you can't do that. He's like, well, you know what? Actually, I'm the emperor of France. And he has 12,000 people cruise out, dude, to a ceremony which lasted for more than four hours, dude, in the freezing cathedral of Notre Dame, dude. Um, The Pope also made the special trip out from Rome, although Napoleon just kind of had him there as a puppet, didn't really let him make a speech, and was just kind of like, okay, you can say, like, one blessing and then just get out of my way, dude. And um, he ended up crowning himself, dude, and uh, his own wife, Josephine. And uh, This is, like, at age 35-ish, 36? Yeah, it's 1804. Wow. Yeah, dude. Kidding me, dude? I made twelve thousand dollars last year. I'm creeping up on that, dude. Let's go, dude. <laughs> and uh, but to compare to spare, bro. You know, I'm chilling, dude. I don't have all the stress, dude. I'm not dealing with the Pope, dude. Um, and basically, Napoleon, as such like a manager, uh, he has every detail down of the ceremony. He knows everything that's going to go on, dude. And a few months later, um, he executes Louis, like the uh, 16th godson. Um, and so basically he's just like, look, dude, I'm taking over. I want no threats, bro. He starts putting his own, um, he becomes like king of of um, Italy, like the, you know, grand premier of the German Confederation after he conquered Russia. Um, and so basically he's like, and this is a time when like France doesn't want monarchies, but he's just now becoming a dictator. So it's very counterintuitive and insane, but it's a time of change. And so, and if you rush things and blitz things, that's sort of what fascists and dictators want. They want to get things over quick. They want to move quick so people don't have time to think or ask questions. And also, he's got a powerful army. He's built up like he is beloved by a lot of people in his country. So he has a backing and you know and a unified voice. But even though there may be more people that disagree with what he's doing, they don't have unity or, or any real means of um, st- standing up to this dude, other than like you know counterinsurgency or guerrilla tactics, which you know really hurt him. And uh, when he conquered Spain, his Spanish campaign, um, which we'll get to in a second. But first, dude, you know, he scores big victory in um, 1805, dude, in Austerlitz, dude. And um, in 1807, Russia and Prussia were forced to sign the peace treaty and um, basically created the Duchy of Warsaw from Polish territory taken from Prussia. This is uh, important because it's going to make a later come into play, which is going to upset the Russians. Um and then so freaking Nor- Napoleon in 1806, dude, he appeared invincible, bro. He's, this is his peak, dude. He's freaking straight up peaking right now. Like Jake probably peaked in Miami when he rented a Lamborghini and probably, you know, filmed an adult-style video as he reinvented himself. So, you know, this is basically what Napoleon's doing at this point, dude. So he's freaking king of Italy, dude, like I said. Freaking pre- the protector of Germany is what he's called, dude. Um, however, in the back of his mind, who's the grand enemy? England, bro. France versus England, dude. He's like, look, he, Napoleon's basically got Europe in his pocket right now. You know, Russia's doing their thing, but whatever, dude. But England, dude, that's the enemy. Um, basically, so then he wants to take over Spain, which has actually always been an ally of France because they would want to create, you know, they don't want to get outweighed in shipping or any taxes. They don't want um, England to get too many powers. So, um, but Spain is kind of not doing exactly what Napoleon wants, and he wants to bring more riches to his people and make sure there's peace at home. And so he goes, you know what, I'm just going to ho- go ahead and cruise into Spain and take over. And he, he has a Spanish campaign. and um, So he's also doing this while we're having our revolution. Well, I guess kind of after. It's right after. In fact, he had a lot of, um, like I mentioned earlier, like, oh, after the French Revolution, and then I go, oh, and then he has his Italian campaign. France helped in our revolution and they would send over and mm-hmm. people have theories it's not proven but maybe it's in some other books like napoleon went and they would go observe battles like they would observe the revolutionary battles um and study strategy and stuff it was like basically a real life lesson you know watching something happen tacit gaining tacit knowledge while you're freaking you know in a, in a very bloody manner so yeah he was they would study the tactics and everything of the um revolutionary generals you know cornwallis and such um 
and then apply it later on here. And of course, technology got a little bit better and stuff. But this is still like in case anyone's wondering, the style of battles Napoleon's fighting are like when the troops are lined up and they have to be very disciplined and like you volley, you send like volleys and, and the bullets are still like round and stuff. So it's, um, and maybe we're getting to a, shells were really like civil war. Um, I'm not sure what your shells came about, but they're much more accurate, but like you have cannon balls. So like they wiggle and go different directions, but you basically just have to like barrage the enemy with like multiple cannons. So you know that you can hit your target. Um, same with like the bullets. So you'd have to get close enough into firing range. Then you stop, then you hold. And you just imagine being on one of those lines, dude, and just knowing that you're going to take the first volley and just no hope way. that you don't get hit. But you like, basically it was the, whatever army was better disciplined. And that's where Napoleon's becomes hugely effective because he had loyalty. He, he would talk his troops up. He would freaking, even though he made a small speech to like the um, consulate, like, you know, you know, he gave freaking fire Braveheart style speeches and was like, look, we're, we're France. We're the grandest army where no one can stop us. And for a while it was true, you know, and it came down to the officer's corps. Did you have officers who could keep the, the soldiers in line? And when the soldiers listened to the officers, because that's what was going to win a lot of battles. And when other soldiers would break down on the other side, um, maybe didn't have, uh, even though they were being attacked and defending their homelands, but like, you know, if Napoleon is just relentless playing psychological warfare, you're like, you have this alien force coming in just being like, dude, they just don't stop. They just don't stop coming down. And that's what Napoleon's style was. So pretty freaking gnarly, dude. Wouldn't want to be one of those dudes nah. taking volleys, bro. There's literally, there's a term called cannon fodder. Yeah, you're exactly. Just, you, that's all you are. That is 100% correct, dude, for one man's ego. Yeah. <laughs> Napoleon's, dude. Um, so freaking going back a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, his Spanish campaign, he wins. It's sort of a Pyrrhic victory. It costs him a lot. And it ends up really costing him in the long run because there's constant guerrilla warfare there. And that's what, like, um, Riley, one of the authors that freaking Jacob brought up earlier, like, says he was not good at counterinsurgency tactics. And it would be really hard to do so. And, I mean, but who was at that time? That's counterinsurgency is a big reason why we, with Minutemen, why the Americans won the revolution. Like British had superior battle forces. The colonial arm, continental army was nothing to them on the battlefield, especially if we didn't have French help, but counterinsurgency was quite effective and it was effective for the Spanish after being conquered by Napoleon. But it took some years later, like 1813, they were, you know, a, a good five year period, but you know, it wears troops down. Then, uh, um, fricking Napoleon, there's an uprising in Austria. Now Napoleon's got to go back there. Um, this is a really, really costly battle. He ends up prevailing, but it's really cost, costly for him. And, and in fact, there was another assassination attempt by like a um, a priest has his son go try to take him out, dude. Take out the tyrant. This uh, this freaking German pastor, Frederick Stapps, dude, sends his son to take out. And in fact, like no, Napoleon had no idea what was happening. Like he was just walking and a young man puts his hand on his coat and freaking brandishes a dagger to stab him, and one of Napoleon's officers stops it, dude. And Napoleon had no idea what was happening. Could have just been murdered. But one of his bros had his back, dude. dude. And that's what's up. But Napoleon's not giving him credit on the battlefield, so it just hurts my heart. Then, dude, um, freaking, we're at 1810 now. We're getting close. I know it's a little laborious listen to this. It's like a lot of information, but dude, you're going to be, you're going to get quizzed on Napoleon at some point in life. And now you're going to have it, dude. Yep. You know, his campaigns, you know what I mean? The Italian campaign, he developed his style. I like to imagine that as him in college, you learning how to bone. He's learning how to be maybe a, a sort of a bottom. I mean, he'd actually probably be a top, but like he's learning when, you know, finesse thrusts and when to bring, you know, throttle up for some power, you know, when to dart and when not to and foreplay. So he's learning these things, you know, the sexual metaphor is always good. You can, if you can create any sort of sexual metaphor, especially a militaristic one, you're going to get a W, you know what I mean? People are going to go, Hey man, can I get you another drink? And you're going to go, sure. And if they don't, after you make a salient point and you go, well, Napoleon, Napoleon's Italian campaign was really where he developed his style as opposed to his uh, Spanish campaign where his style, um, quite honestly, didn't adapt. And, um, you know, a counterinsurgency led to um, sort of the um, table setting for his downfall. You know, people would claim Russia was that, the Russian campaign, but really the table is being set in Spain. Hey, um, Chris, can you get me another fucking beer? <laughs> yeah, that's how you do it. That's how you hold court, dude. Um, so then there's sort of a new hope, 1810, Nicole, Napoleon 
wants to you know expand his empire but maybe he's getting a little tired now not through battle he contacts Tsar alexander the first of russia and he goes dude can i marry because napoleon's been married he gets a divorce dude he's had two uh female um kids two daughters that's what those are called i don't know i'm talking like an alien uh, two uh, kids who are females uh, he has two daughters but he needs a male heir and uh he goes dude can i freaking marry one of the russian monarch sisters Alexander refuses, dude. He does not like Napoleon. He does not like him setting up his empire on his border close to him in Prussia. Um, he does not like that uh, he went down there and, yeah, well, like I mentioned in his uh, difficult Austrian campaign, he sets up um, himself as and creates like a brand new state down there. And then once, um, once the Tsar Alexander refuses, Napoleon goes, oh, that's great, dude. Don't worry about that, bro. I'm just going to go ahead and go to my Prussian territory, and I'm going to um, marry someone from there. And he does. He marries uh, Mary Louise, and uh, who's, in, in a fun fact, the grandniece of Queen Marie Antoinette. So ironically, Napoleon is the great nephew by marriage of Louis the Sixteenth. So very interesting. Um, so basically, that's something you would tell Chris to get you another beer after you said that fun fact. Or when he comes back from getting a beer, you finish making that fun fact and you go, oh, dude, you didn't get yourself one? <laughs> Dominated, dude. It's Napoleon style. Because um, you take both. And so basically, he sets up himself and creates a new governor. He's been putting like his um, basically, he does take care of his bros and like distant family members by putting them like as like, you know, consulate or governor of like Italy or the governor of Naples, big port provinces, important areas, people he can trust. Um, and he does that close to Russia and Russia goes, nah, dude, can't have that. So Russia declares war, but then Napoleon in true Napoleonic fashion, he goes, nah, I'm going to be first to battle. And that was huge at this time. You want to be first to battle. And he knows that. Um, so basically let's go through the Russian disaster of 1812 here, starting in 1812. Um, the peace at Tilst, that's after uh, 1807, did not prevent Franco-Russian antagonism for long. Alexander I could not accept the creation of the Duchy of Warsaw. That's what I was saying, what he just did down there in Prussia, and was becoming impatient regarding the war with the Ottoman Empire. So Russia's got, got its handful um, with the Ottomans um, in its division. So basically, w through colonialism and the British breaking up the Ottoman Empire, you, it turns out to be a historical mistake. The Ottomans were open to religious... As long as you paid your taxes, they were chill. Um, you know, then greedy European uh, colonialists want to get in there and get a piece of that and that, you know, the oil and feed their military machines and such and so forth. Anyway, um, taking the French annexation of the freaking German duchy of Oldenburg, dude, it was just a fire freaking, you know, password for you because no one's going to be able to figure that out. As a pretext, Alexander I declares war on April 8th, 1812. In June, Napoleon invades Russia with a force of 480,000 troops, dude. Keeping in reserve another 120,000, dude. This is important. Wow. Yeah, bro. So he's like, we're going all in, bro. The Russian tactics centered on refusing battle, dude, disrupting the French forces and forcing them to spread out and become dispersed. So, like I mentioned, dude, people kind of study uh, Napoleon's style. They know that he's coming to overwhelm with his force of 480,000, then send in that other 120,000 when... Uh, you know, the enemy just feels like they might have a foothold. It just really goes and puts the heel on the neck. But the Russians have studied, and they know that in, through the Spanish campaign, um, they're like, look, dude, counterinsurgency works. We need to fight small battles and weaken this beast a little bit at a time. Um, the French easily took Vinales because, I mean, look, the Russians are putting up mild, mild um, defensive tactics here because their strategy is to uh, avoid big battles in Smolensk. On the 7th of September, Napoleon takes them both. Um, Kustinov emerges victorious, dude. The Battle of Bordeno, dude. And then he's at the freaking gates of Moscow a week later, dude. And um, the Russians destroy, like, any ammunition or anything that they could have uh, so the French can't profit from it. Um, then Napoleon begins his retreat on the 18th of October. Um, so basically it's like, okay, you came and conquered, but the Russians just went back and they're like, you really didn't take anything. We just kind of, like hid from you and you know we know you're not going to stay here so um the army experiences great difficult great difficulty the french army dude um in crossing the swollen berenzia river belarus and so 28 and 29 november dude napoleon is warned of a possible coup d'etat in paris like i mentioned earlier so this is going to make him rather than go and pursue the russians where they're hiding he's like dang dude i'm going to cruise out he leaves his officers ney and marat in charge of the remaining troops 
but horrendous weather conditions uh, ensue, and that only 20,000 soldiers returned to France alive. Um, 100,000 did not make it out alive from um, that crossing of the, of the soldiers that he left back there. So he still has a lot of the Grand Army, but, you know, he loses 80,000 soldiers due to weather. Dude. Another knock on his uh, him as a logistician, logistician um, which is big a big part of being a general. So that's why he's a freaking fire commander, not maybe the best general. Yeah, if you're going to go to Russia, man, you got to go in the spring. A freaking man, dude. Uh, and be out. Exactly. You get in, you mid, get out, which would suit his style. October, you get you get out of there. Yeah, exactly, dude. And treat it like you're planning a wedding, dude. You know, and he's partying on grass, dude. It's like, dude, when you want to be partying on lawns, that's how I imagine everyone party during Napoleonic times, just on lawns, dude, wearing too hot of clothes, sweating and sipping champagne. I'm like, dude, you get out, bro. So Napoleon's weekend, bro. His Grand Army returns to France from Russia, dude, although I guess kind of successful, but really it's the beginning of the downfall here. Uh, there's the Battle of the Nations, dude, because, uh, you know, Napoleon is no longer seen as invincible, dude. And a ton of, uh, it's called the Battle of the Nations because uh, there's so many allies, dude. So French allies who are not Napoleon, who do not like Napoleon, ally with Poles uh, and freaking um, the Kingdom of Saxony is going up against them. That's a, um, a British one. The freaking Russians, Austrians, Prussians, and Swedes is a num- and freaking other soldiers from freaking other you know smaller european states dude basically tally up to about three hundred thousand, dude going up against freaking napoleon dude um there he faces defeat there dude 1814 this is the french campaign dude these big um you know nationalist uh freaking nation style armies dude freaking multinational armies dude are cruising into france now they're gonna take the capital napoleon's headed back there dude. he pulls a u-turn dude to go freaking post up at this imperial residence chateau de fontainebleau dude and freaking he posts up there then in 1815 this is the year where it all freaking goes down dude on march 1st 1815 napoleon landed at gulf juan dude crossed the alps and arrived in Grenoble, dude where an army commanded by ney awaited him dude that's one of his boys dude he's like all right dude i'm posting up now let's go dude so he of course napoleon in true napoleonic style decides to preempt the allied forces and invade belgium with a force of 130k troops dude and um, after defeating Blucher and Prussian troops there, he's preparing for a decisive battle at, you guessed it, Waterloo, dude, south of Brussels in Belgium, dude. Uh, always stuff going down in Belgium, dude. It's like the sort of the middle ground of Europe, makes sense. Um, but Ney and some of his other generals were um, facing staunch frickin' um, English defenses and resistance, and they're unable to link up. So Napoleon's defeated on 18th of June. Um, and basically he talks to some of his advisors and he could, you know, he could prolong resistance and do counterinsurgency. Uh, but Napoleon capitulates on the 22nd of June and he's handed his defeat. Louis the 18th, therefore reigns, dude, the flower, the violet becomes a, a symbol of the, um, Napoleon, um, freaking Bonaparte supporters or Bonapartists. And, um, basically Napoleon, this is when Aaron, what you were saying in 1821, he dies at St. Helena, but Napoleon's sent to St. Helena with like a small contingency of like, you know, his wife, his some servants, but basically the island is like super far out there, like almost like 2,000 kilometers from any other settled territory. The weather's terrible. It's cold. It's basically a cliff, dude. Or what am I saying? It has sheer cliffs. Um, so basically it's not like you're posting up on an island and having a dank time, which is what you would imagine on like the Bahamas. It's an unchill, stormy island. Um, you know, he basically goes nuts on there. He will have spouts of depression. Then he'll like create a, like an amazing garden. And, um, yeah, dude, he writes, you know, he ends up writing and, um, you can read the freaking his, um, what do they call that? Like memoirs, I guess, dude. And, uh, yeah, dude, he ends up dying out there, bro. And then later his body is exhumed and brought over. Um, and now it's, uh, sits in like a, um, uh, not a mausoleum because it's not on display, but he's buried next to one of his um, sons or grandsons, I think. And um, yeah, dude, so you can go see it. I've actually been there in freaking Paris, dude. So, I mean, that's basically the rundown, dude. That's what's up, dude. Wow. It's a lot. Yeah, man. It's dense, dude. Dude, a lot going on. Basically, that's him as his, you know, a commander goes through his campaigns, but now it gave me a more rudimentary 
understanding of what this dude did, what it was all about. I'm always like, Napoleon, and then what, what went on in Russia? I didn't know. I thought like he went to Russia and they like kind of took him out. Yeah. But he went there, had success because they didn't really fight. Like the Russians were smart. Yeah, they, they just, just kind of strength. Yep. And they let the weather take care of them, dude, because they know their land better than an invading force. Yeah, it's kind of like, like in World um, War II. It's almost like a wave. Like he shows up, they retreat back like a wave. Yep. And they're like, all right. And then they start coming. Exactly, dude. Oof. Snipe them out. And that's what Riley says in his book. He's not good at counterinsurgency. Had he better, had he adapted his style? This is when generals were able to adapt, um, you know, because his style was progressive when it first started and it was bold and it really, really worked. It conquered Europe for him. But it also, like you said, it was, it was ended up being, it got him the glory, but it also led to blunder, right? All right, dude, let's take a few cues and we'll head on out. What up, Strider? Aaron the Beast. I'm writing you today because I'm in desperate need of some serious wisdom from the king himself. Dude, what up, dude? Freaking Napoleon, dude. Today at work, I was told by one of my coworkers that my manager said she thinks I'm cute. No problem, right? Wrong. The problem lies in the fact that I think she is also attractive. From the first time I saw her, I knew there was going to be trouble. I'm always joking and throwing little jabs in her direction. My question is, do I go for her and risk losing my job, a job that I do not care about losing but would prefer to keep? If this is the answer, how should I go about asking her out? Or am I blowing her little compliment out of proportion and do I need to fight nature to push my attraction for her down? Love the pot and the energy you exhibit, dude. Thank you, man. Freaking legend, bro. Um, Freaking Noah, dude. What up? Um, actually, no, that's not Noah. Noah's going to be the next question. This guy wants to be anonymous. Um, dude, Aaron, I mean, if it's a job he doesn't care about, dude, and I mean, honestly, I would say, look, if he's looking for a one-time hookup, I wouldn't probably risk that, and I wouldn't do that. I don't know if that, like, I mean, maybe you guys would get stoked on it for a little bit, and that's chill. I mean, I don't necessarily equate, like, do you think it definitely means he's going to lose his job if they end up hooking up? I guess if, like, people find out like will upper management end his job like why is that going to be the end of his job or is that yeah. just like going back to the saying of like don't dip the pen in the company ink is it like that type of thing is it yeah is it the superior is there is one of them superior to the other where that's really tricky or yeah it sounds like his boss the female is the superior and in my instance i'm like i don't feel like she's using her job to get him to do something that he wouldn't want to do i feel like it's not like that yeah. which would be obviously wrong i think it's like Oh, they, they kind of vibe on each other, and one person still, is a manager. I don't it's know. still awkward as fuck, though, if it, when, it, when it ends. That's the thing. The thing is, they know it's probably both going to end. They probably know it's no, both not long-term. They think each other is, each one is cute. So I would say if he's not looking to um, keep this job, I would say you would want to line yourself up with something or know what direction you want to go with your career. Um, you know, definitely I wouldn't burn any bridges or do anything nuts, but I think... Um, Honestly, maybe it's a little risky advice, but I mean, it's the Q team, dude. You know, times are tough, dude. And you know, you have horniness, dude. You got to answer the call. When horniness comes a knocking, dude, psh, you got to answer. Yeah. You know? So I think you go for it, dude. I think you don't get crude about it. I wouldn't do anything like public displays of affection, especially in the office setting or anything like that. But, um, you know, then you got to try to keep a secret and it's going to end. But, you know, dude, maybe it could turn into love. So I think take a shot, dude. You know, take a shot. If, if he was the boss and she was the, I would say maybe nah, that might be whatever, but he's the dude, the lady's the boss, dude. I'm like, I think it's all good. Yeah. I think that dynamic's pretty freaking fire. Dude. I think you go for it, dude. Um, no, you're not taking the compliment out of proportion. It's nice, dude. Someone thinks you're freaking handsome, dude. What up, dude? Um, he did say he always knew it would be trouble, though, and, you know, just be mature about it, dude. Be honest, dude. Be honest in your communication. Um, all right, here we go, dude. What up, legend? Hope you and your dank GF are staying well in the Q team. Here's the sitch. A girl that I have been close to for a while has let me know that she's interested in potentially getting it on. In the past, I have also been interested with in this with her as well. I was interested until she said she only wants to get practice to fuck another hotter, more ripped dude. This naturally made me feel pretty shitty. I'm leaning towards not participating because I also don't want to lose my V card and I feel like the long run, I probably won't look back and regret the experience that much. Thanks for always bringing dank content and a great attitude. Keep it up, man. Strider, dude. Um, okay, dude. I would say go ahead and be the freaking experiment, dude. As long as you like know the sandbox 
and the rules that you're playing in, you're not going to get attached. And like, then you can, and you can both, uh, approach that maturely. That's chill. Um, yeah, dude. If it's consensual, but if it's your V card and you're precious about it and you want to have a relationship looking back, then I would say, I would, I would definitely say don't do it. Nah, I'm all for it. I'm, I, I was, you know, I was virgin, uh, long too, mm. uh, older, not, not crazy, but you know, uh, it's just so like, you're not going to, you're not going to be with the person that you lose your virginity to for your life. So, and so just go for it. Like have fun. Like listen to the song night moves by Bob Seger. Great call. Uh, great call. It's all about spending the summer with a girl and just practicing and you'll be better for it, man. I mean, who cares if like there's some other dude down the horizon she wants, like you'll, there's other girls down the horizon that you'll want that you'll be with. And so like, better to especially if she knows the score that you're a virgin like yeah and, and she may be too like fuck, go for it like there's no yeah. reason yeah dude i think you just gotta go <clears throat> you know don't treat the virginity thing so you're a dude you know what i mean and maybe get a little more Reese here on you but it's like yeah aaron i'm sway dude and, and you put on a fire song and you enjoy the experience dude you live life dude suck the vine enjoy it Maybe you put on a little strawberry wine, dude, which is, you know, you put yourself in the female's perspective, dude. You know, it's a hot, young, hot, young farm hand and she's the farmer's daughter and, you know, down by the creek, you know, it's first love. So sweet, bittersweet. And I think it's going to be all sweet, dude. You know what I mean, dude? Um, so I think, yeah, dude, I think you got a fire situation and I wouldn't, um, you only live once, bro. Yeah. And if it's, especially if it sounds like it's going to be a thing that's going to go on for a little bit. Like she's saying practice, like, Oh, so that means it's going to be, yeah, bro. it's going to be, it's going to be a few, you know, several times over a small period. Like that's, that's way better. Like, yeah, dude, that's fire, dude. And if it, it was a one, if it was like a one bing, bang, boom, done, never see that person again. Eh, maybe not, you know? Yeah, Exactly. And hopefully the age thing is different and hopefully she, you know, hopefully she's not really taking advantage of you and doing this. So be aware of that. But it sounds like that's not the case here. Um, you know, she's way older or whatever. I don't want you to do like, like a, the freaking, a teacher style freaking stuff here with like, yeah. So, you know, if it's that type of scenario, then big time no go. But you know, if you guys are close in age and all that, it sounds like she just wants to bone ripped hot dudes and be good at boning. Um, and so maybe you guys can both get good at boning together, be honest about it. Maybe you guys create an Excel spreadsheet about it, you know, get a little, maybe somewhat clinical and you can maybe have fun that way. But yeah, put on some good, good tunes, dude. Bob Seger night moves. Great call. I'm Working just saying the song, the song is about this sort of thing. So it's just like, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like, yeah, this was our summer. Then we moved on with our lives and we're adults now. And I hope she's okay. Exactly. I don't know. A hundred percent. Have some fun. Like. You only live once. It's a dumb phrase, but it's true. Like it's cliche for a reason, dude. Take you know, take what take what's take what's out there. You'll learn something no matter what. Yep. Exactly, dude. All right, just do one more, dude. Uh let's see here. Strider, what up, dude? I have absolutely no game. I have a good sized hog that I think ladies would enjoy, but I have no game when talking to ladies. I feel like we are both missing out because I have a very nice sized dick, but no charm. How do I get fire, fire Chad level charisma so that ladies can experience my hog and I can experience love with Stoke, Dustin? I mean, get good size hog on a t-shirt for one. Smart. Yeah. Let people know what you're all about. I mean, you can't just go around plopping out your D piece. No. Nope. But, you know, and you, I think you have more to offer than just your, your, your piece of meat, you know? I think the personality department, you know, you read some books crush some movies, listen to some tunes, um, work on your cooking, you know, be, char you know, that's going to work on your charm naturally. You don't need to be like, you don't need to like be witty or like have like one liners. It's just like, no, like have interests. And then you're going to meet someone who has similar interests. And then you're almost like, you're not a magician. You know, a magician has to work on tricks and to every trick there is the setup. There is the turn and then what is there there's the prestige right so for you you know you have to go ahead you have you've reached out dude that's your setup okay now you're gonna work on it go ahead you know take a cooking class at sur la table dude freaking go ahead and you know decorate your apartment with dank dank decor dude 
read some books, take a master class, you know, hit the gym, dude. You know, and you know, maybe you'll, some of these will get knocked off, but basically find your interests and someone who has those similar interests is going to organically find you and put yourself out there, maybe on the apps or spark up some conversations, but that confidence is going to happen the more you practice going to the gym. Freaking, I'm fired up on cooking right now. I don't know. Maybe you're into fashion, dressing cool, whatever it is, dude. And then you've done that. And then the prestige of this will be your fat hog. And that's really going to wow your future dank GF. That's going to be the prestige of it. Whoa, this guy's cool. He's he's sensitive. He's into hiking. And I'm into hiking. And oh my gosh, he's got a fat schlong. That's tight. You know? So you've got that to fall back on, Dustin. Um, keep that in mind. Yeah. You know, and just, this keeps you from having to pull a Jake, a.k.a. a formerly known as Ern and re, Aaron, and reinvent yourself, you know? You're not reinventing. You're just discovering. Discover you, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to discover someone as well who will teach you even more new things about you. It's fun. And game is overrated. Like, yeah, no, just game. be real. Be honest, and that's all that matters. Like, That's it. It's not game, dude. Yeah. Game is like lying about what you're interested in and like negging and like, you know, some of the part of like flirting is part of that. And you got to have some confidence talking, but I think the confidence in you will come by, by naturally um, exploring stuff you're interested in. And that's what's freaking up, dude. Yep. And then once you're that, you're Napoleonic, dude. You're out there and you're just freaking opening up conversations. And guess what? You're going to have some failures, but that's okay. Keep going, dude. Yeah. If you wear button downs, plop a hand in there every now and again. Yeah. You know? Plop a hand. Yeah, exactly. While you're sitting down, put one in. Itch yourself a little bit. Stretch out your arm ah, while you're making a point, you know, in the middle of a conversation. Mm -hmm. Alpha gesturing. Sick. All right, dude. That's freaking it. A little rundown of Napoleon. Thank you, Jacob, dude. For Lipinski freaking ledge, dude, for the fire research, dude. Legend. I'm just freaking the medium right now, dude. Just the medium. Getting it out there, baby. Aaron, thank you for the fire advice, dude. Legend on the sticks, dude. Freaking beast, dude. Um, you know, send me some more suggestions, dude, comments, corrections, whatever, dude. Just say what up if you want to, dude. Strider Wilson Treads at gmail.com or DM me, History's Dank Podcast on Insta, dude. All right, dude. Freaking late.